Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Big Ideas on the Go. I'm excited to have as our guest, uh, somebody who's uh, been in the kind of privacy milieu um, long before um, myself and, and our company have, have been in it. Uh, Trevor Hughes from the IPP, president of IPP uh, and CEO of IPP. Um, uh, Trevor, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your journey uh, in terms of how you got involved um, uh, with privacy and, and how you started the IPP. So maybe um, you could talk a little bit about kind of your 18 years now uh, sure. with that organization, how it got its foundation, and, you know, just tell us the history. Sure. So hi, Dimitri. It's great to be here with you and to have a chance to chat. And um, Gosh, it's, it feels like just yesterday, but it has been a while now that the field of privacy, you know, essentially established itself and, and emerged. Um, the IEPP is now in its 21st year. So technically, I didn't found the IEPP. Back then, I actually was a, a dues-paying member. I was a practicing privacy professional myself. I worked uh, as the head of privacy for an ad tech company in the late 90s, early 2000s, and you know, got to know many of the people who are still active in our space. And that early network of people, and there were not a lot of us back then, that early network of people realized that there was a need for sharing information and um, really establishing the, the field that we were building. And so the IEPP came out of that. For the first couple of years, it ran largely through a volunteer board of directors who uh, did just about everything um, short of making the coffee at the, the conferences we ran back then. Um, but they were writing the articles for the newsletter, publishing them, programming the conferences, doing all of those things. And in relatively short order, it became clear that um, there would be a need for some permanent staff. And I was a young privacy professional. I was running another trade association, the Network Advertising Initiative at the time, which was an ad tech trade association. So I was well known to the space and had a bit of experience running nonprofit associations. And so, yeah, just over 18 years ago, I uh, took the role at the IEPP and it was a tiny, tiny thing back then. Um, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but we had just over 300 members, I think. and something like $30,000 in the bank. It was not a lot. And, and the story that I often tell is that um, I remember telling my wife, we had two young children at home. And of course, none of the jobs that I had provided benefits or anything like that. So I remember telling my wife that I would network like crazy and find a job as a CPO somewhere and we'd be okay. But, um, but yeah, it was not clear in, in that dot-com bubble popping era post 9-11, um, that, uh, that this was going to be an ongoing affair. And then, of course, the past 18 years, it's just been a story of developing products and services and things that our members need, but also this enormous issue of privacy all around the world just exploding every single day. And, and I, I'm sure, like you, I, I often have to pinch myself and, and just think, gosh, how did we end up in this space that's so dynamic and so full of growth and challenge? It's, uh, it's really quite fun. Yeah, no, look, so obviously soon after the dot-com and I remember those days myself, um, you know, starting from uh, 300 members, you have how many members today at the, in the IPP? Six, 68,000 in over 120 countries. Uh, amazing, so, you know, obviously, there were regulations for privacy then, there are regulations for privacy now. Give us a little bit of your view on how things have changed. Is it just around the penalty? Is it about the ubiquity in terms of the number of countries? What's different? I think there are a lot of things that are different and, and I don't think it's possible to point to just one. So let me just give you like a, a greatest hits list of the past 20 years, things that I think have driven our field. First, um, Back in 2000, we did think that we were going to get national privacy legislation back then. Uh, and lots of people were saying it was, it was a done deal in the United States. Of course, it never happened. What we did get was the Can Spam Act, which drove some marketing privacy issues. Cookie issues never went away. In 2003, SB 1386 passed in California, and that was the very first notice of data breach law in the world. So it really innovated public policy with regards to data breach notification. That really drove uh, a lot of things. 
We had some quiet years, but then it was clear that GDPR was going to be reintroduced or, or uh, the Data Protection Directive was going to be revised and, and emerge as the GDPR. That drove a, a lot of activity. Um, without question, the Edward Snowden revelations uh, drove activity into our space. Um, I think, though, that in the past five years, we really have to point to GDPR as the major driver um, in the field of, of privacy around the world for moving organizations towards a more systematic, more accountability-based, um, more operationally um, um, uh, full of integrity. You know, the, the operations around privacy just have a, a lot more stability and integrity. So those are some of the things. Now, today, the issue is ubiquitous. Um, and we see privacy emerging on so many fronts, and that's one of the things that makes it so cool. You know, Apple has full-on Super Bowl ads that are um, promoting privacy, and they are differentiating in the marketplace aggressively. It's not like, you know, the third product feature they mentioned. It is the, the basis upon which they are selling many of their products and services. Um, countries around the world are passing laws like crazy. China and India will very, very likely have their first national privacy laws this year, which means that 50% of the world's population is going to have its first national privacy law that, this year. That's crazy. Um, we are seeing privacy emerge as a geopolitical power issue. So clearly Europe and the United States, but now also China are really marking territory and claiming um, a power and stabilizing their control over the information economy. It's, there never could be a better time. I know day to day, the, um, the, the work in a privacy program, in a, in a privacy department, in an organization, can feel overwhelming when you're responding to the upteenth data subject access request that you have. But when you do step back and look at the big picture, gosh, we are, we are in the most dynamic and risk-filled field um, at the most incredible moment. Somehow we ended up here. It's pretty cool. So, so look, you're right. The fact that you're, it's kind of topical in a Super Bowl ad is, is pretty incredible. Um, so just in the last couple of months, you've seen various states like Virginia and, and Illinois and now Florida um, talk about introducing privacy legislation. I think New York, uh, the New York governor has also said that he's going to sign something. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of how that evolves in the states? Are you going to see um, versions of CCPA across the U.S.? Are you going to see a federal law? Is, is the evolution of privacy in America going to be driven by these these statewide regulations, or is it going to be companies like Apple that really, uh, you know, push push the envelope? Yeah, so I, so you, uh, we could spend an hour talking about this issue. Let me just hit some high points. First of all, I think state activity will increase. We, we know it will increase. Um, <laughs> Virginia has a law on the governor's desk. Oklahoma has a bill that looks like it's coming out of um, their, um, their uh, legislative body. We are seeing activity all across the United States. Washington will likely pass a bill. Um, th there are many, many states that are doing a lot right now. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Kirk Nara, one of the founding members of the board of directors of the IEPP, a lawyer in uh, DC, um, he has something that I have dubbed the, the Nara conjecture, which is three to five comprehensive state privacy laws equals federal privacy legislation. And I think he's right. I actually think it's on the higher end of that conjecture range. So, you know, five major states passing um, comprehensive state privacy law, and I think we get national privacy legislation. The other thing that he added, and this is in an interview we did with him just last week, is that the deal doesn't get better for industry with every new state law. In fact, it gets worse. And so in terms of industry, being willing to accept things like more limited preemption, private causes of action, other things like that. Um, the negotiating hand for industry and those who are trying to push back on those kinds of ideas, um, th their hand gets worse and worse the more state laws we receive. Now, let me add two other major points here because I think they're really important to note. First, with regards to state law, if I am a legislator in a major state and I look at CCPA, CPRA, I look at the Virginia law, I look at the Washington Privacy Act, I look at these various laws, and I think to myself, okay, we, we deserve a privacy law in our state. 
there is very little incentive for that state legislator to just photocopy CPRA and put it into uh, his or her own state law. In fact, the incentive that exists in order to have industry pay attention to what your law is doing is to make it a little bit different, to somehow say, look, the people of my great state are different and they care about privacy in a different way. So therefore, we're gonna do things our own way here in this state and we're gonna make things a little bit different. We have been down this road before. We know um, data breach legislation, almost 50 states have passed that now, and it looks different state to state to state to state. Um, uh, email marketing legislation, anti-spam legislation prior to the Can't Spam Act looked different state to state to state to state. States have an incentive to pass something that looks a little bit different than what every other state has done. And so don't think that we're gonna end up with this nice kind of common denominator across states, you're gonna end up with a really complex patchwork quilt of state privacy laws. That's the first point. Second point, um, we are seeing the emergence of, and it's not even the emergence of, it's been around forever, but um, the power of platforms to drive privacy policy decisions is enormous. Look, this goes back to Larry Lessig's book, Code and Other Laws of Privacy, or Other Laws of Cyberspace back in, the 1990s, which was really one of the foundational texts of the entire field, frankly, for us. But if you look at browser controls, you look at platform controls, you look at the power of the operating systems on mobile devices and on um, desktop devices, those environments have an enormous, enormous amount of policy with regards to how data is managed in today's information economy. And so as much as organizations need to be paying attention to the centers of political power, they also should be paying attention to those platforms that aggregate technological power and create platform standards, whether it's cookie management controls within a browser, whether it's... Um, uh, app uh, store standards for getting access into an, an app store, um, whether it's the, 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 the ad IDs and other devices that are being used on, on, um, on smart devices now. Those are enormously consequential when, with regards to privacy in today's world as well. So again, just an incredibly complex environment with so many moving parts and so many different interests at play. Um, it, it certainly is, it, it can be overwhelming, I think, for many. And so if you're uh, an organization, a company, most of your members belong to some, some company, commercial, commercial entity, how do they, how do they, how are they supposed to look at the kind of the diversity of legislation? Are there some common things or how do they prepare themselves for the fact that they're going to, they may see eventually 50 uh, U.S. states with diverse uh, privacy regulations, maybe yep. at, at, at 10 or 9 uh, there's a federal law. But again, how do they manage? Yeah, so I, look, I think it's different for every company. And so I don't want to answer for all companies, but I can tell you some of the things that we're seeing around the world. So first of all, most organizations start with a foundational compliance program. Um, many are using GDPR as that foundational base. Uh, some, if they're U.S. only, don't have any European intersection and, and little international intersection, maybe they use CCPA or CPRA, but you start somewhere. And GDPR, frankly, is a good place to start, and that is where many organizations start. Start with a foundational base, and then you derogate from there based on jurisdictions that you're in, risk that you're exposed to and new laws and other issues that emerge. So for example, if there is a do not sell button requirement and you're using GDPR as your base, will you plug that into your broader program? So most organizations today start with the framework of a baseline. Um, often that's GDPR, but it can be other things as well. Um, and, then, and then use derogations as they emerge around the world in various laws to help address their compliance program. Beyond that though, you got to get help. You got to get help in a number of ways. First of all, you need smart people in the right places making good decisions. We've got 68,000 members. We're adding 1,000 members a month. We've still grown through the pandemic. Privacy is still driving enormous numbers of professionals into the world. And it's not because everyone thinks that privacy pros are trendy all of a sudden. It's because there's an enormous amount of work out there. 
And if there ever was a time to be an experienced privacy pro, your market value is going up and up and up. So we got to get people into the right places. And then I think perhaps most significantly, you got to get tools. And I'm not just saying this because I'm on your podcast. Great you got to get... You gotta, you got to get tools. Back when I started in the field of privacy in the late 90s, we literally ran things off of email and Excel spreadsheets. Like we were creating charts and lists and sending emails back and forth to try and manage everything. That is absolute malpractice in today's world. You need a platform from which you can manage a sophisticated privacy program. It needs to be scalable based on the size of your organization, based on the international exposure of your organization, but you need the tools. So it's um, start with a framework, make sure you got good people in place and make sure you give your people good tools to manage the program. And then you do the work. I, I, I have this saying that, um, that I like, which is good faith is good business. And what it means for me is that you will never fully eliminate risk um, uh, with privacy from your corporate balance sheet. So if you're looking at risk as an issue that you're trying to mitigate down towards zero, you're never gonna get to zero. Um, but good faith is good business. And most regulators around the world most courts around the world are going to look very favorably upon those organizations that can show their homework, that can show that they made a good faith effort to address the issues, to address compliance, to address all of these things and making appropriate investments in people and technology. That's a big part of that. Yeah, it sounds like uh, organizations clearly have to, it's, it's more than ample time for them to kind of um, uh, again, you know, be proactive and um, lean in, as, as they say. So that's great. Yep. So, so look, you've already predicted a few things for this year, right? I think 50% of the world is going to be covered by um, privacy legislation if you include China and India. Uh, we've talked a little bit about kind of the state laws that are kind of uh, right at the cusp of getting uh, passage. So where will we be in a year? And how do you think the next five years looks? Yeah, so... Um... I think the next year, let's extend it just a little bit, 18 months, 24 months, the next, the next year to two years are going to be some of the most consequential ever in the history of privacy. Over the course of the next five years, I think we will see this go even more mainstream than it is today. When I look at prior fields which have emerged in the past 20, 30, 40 years, fields like information security, that growth curve is pretty clear, and we're about 15 years behind the information security field, but it has many millions of professionals all around the world. It has billions of dollars of investment into the technologies for managing information security. I think we're on a similar path towards that type of kind of broad systemic, um, really whole market approach where every CEO and every board of directors knows um, what data privacy is and how their organization is managing it, um, where the chief privacy officer is well known within the organization and is intersecting actively, um, not only with those who are touching data, but those who are building products, those who are protecting data, um, those who are managing data, um, the, the entire enterprise. Let me just toss out uh, one or two other interesting things. I think the risks of privacy are going to increase as well. And it's not just fines under GDPR, although it is notable that the Wall Street Journal had an article this week where Helen Dixon, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner said, there is a strong pipeline of enforcement actions coming. And yeah. so like, be aware, GDPR, it's, it's not that the regulators were sort of sitting on their hands waiting um, they've been working on cases, and those first rounds of waves are going to hit the shores of industry, I think, this year. Um, but look at other innovative enforcement um, tools. So, for example, the FTC just last month introduced an idea which I think we'll hear more of, which is disgorgement where in an enforcement action in a privacy case, they said, not only do you have to write a check to pay for a fine, but you also have to delete the data you collected inappropriately. You have to unwind your machine learning AI systems to a point prior to the introduction of that inappropriately collected data. You basically have to reset everything back to prior to 
your inappropriate collection or use of data. When we talk about disruption to an enterprise, look, a CEO is always going to hate writing a check to a regulator because there's there's been a violation and a fine needs to be paid. But tell an organization that they have to unwind two, three, four, five years of data use from every system that that data has touched. This idea of disgorgement, and you're gonna hear that word a lot in the coming years, this idea of disgorgement has raised the risk profile of privacy massively. So privacy is gonna become more mainstream. You're gonna see more solutions, more people, more professionals, more laws. The US will have a law passed without question within the next five years, but so too will the risks increase. We are going to see not only financial risks continue to grow and multiply, but innovation will occur within enforcement as well. And ideas like disgorgement, probably class actions are also going to happen. It's, it's going to, I, we're gonna need a bigger boat, as they said in the movie Jaws. Um, it's, uh, we're going to be a much bigger field and um, it is, depending on how you look at it, exciting times or really scary times coming towards us. Well, I can tell you that there's some, some investors that are probably going to be very reassured by, by everything you just said. So, uh, <laughs> look, I, I think, I think they're, they're interesting times and clearly I think, you know, having come from the security world and knowing how large and massive that investment is and seeing the growth and privacy just in the short short time I've been involved with the big ID and, and IPP as well, it's been pretty remarkable. And so I think lots lots of interesting things to happen. So uh, Trevor, uh, I do want to thank you again for, for joining us on this podcast. Um, it's been terrific to, to have you as a guest. I get we've gotten to know each other over the past few years and it's been terrific. Um, I also want to uh, thank every, all the listeners uh, and everyone, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to Big Ideas on the Go. Uh, and please leave reviews uh, as always. Thank you again, Trevor. Hey, thanks, Dimitri. It was fun.